Hi everyone, thank you for taking your time to join our live webinar today. As some of you who have been regular participants of our webinars, you may know who I am. And for those who are new, my name is Grace and I plan all of the exciting things here that happen at BenQ, including and organizing these webinars. I will be your co-host this evening with our main star, Ian, who is back for the third time now. And for those who don't know who Ian is, he is a multi-award winning commercial photographer based in Melbourne here in, uh, in Australia. He specialises in advertising, aerial, fashion, food, corporate people, public relations, portraiture, product and industrial photography. He also first opened his studio, Altered Images Photography, back in 1986. Our webinar session today will be very different from our previous sessions. With Ian's expertise, he'll be helping the attendees and the viewers get the best out of their photos by helping them reach the photograph's full potential. We have asked you to send through the images, the raw and edited files, and Ian will select a few to speak about and advise like his tips on how he would edit. Feel free to ask the questions after he has gone through each, I guess, uh, each file, and then we'll try to get back to you on the answers. There will be a quick survey once the webinar finishes. If you could please provide some of your feedback, that would be great. And will also help for the future webinars. We'll also include some links in the chat if you want to check out more of Ian's work and the monitor he's been using in his setup. Now over to Ian. Thank you, Grace. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm glad that we have uh, such a strong attendance tonight. Tonight's going to be a little bit differently uh, presented to webinars I've done in the past where I haven't actually prepared anything. So what we have is a whole series of images from you guys that we will go through and what I thought we might do is critique them and I'll talk about things to look out for, how I would possibly edit them. And then if we have time, go back and select some and actually do some edits ourselves to see how we go. Um, I'm gonna show just a couple of images of mine first, just to give you the idea, or I suppose the philosophy behind how I approach my image editing and the way I, I do things. I think the most important thing to take on board is that image editing really is subjective. So I've just spent a few days away with some friends and there's about eight photographers there. And it's amazing that in a room of eight photographers that we all do things differently. So what I'm gonna tell you tonight really is just my viewpoint. What I tell everyone is you need to be true to yourself, but I'm gonna point things out that um, I would perhaps suggest you look at, revisit. I'll try and point out strong points and areas of improvement. But above all, I want you to, to, to go away understanding that really it's your interpretation or your vision of a scene that is important and you need to stick to that. Don't let anyone tell you that you need to change it because then it's not really your image anymore. What I'd suggest you do is listen to critique, listen to suggestions, but take on board what you feel is going to improve the image and disregard those that you don't because everybody sees it differently. So I will just share my screen and uh, where am I? There we go. I'm just gonna go to, I'll just show you a couple of images um, from last week. I was lucky enough, fortunate enough to go up to the Hunter Valley um, and I'm, I was fortunate enough to go there, but I'm fortunate that it rained pretty much every day by the first morning. So the images that I'm gonna show you here were pretty much all taken on the first morning, but I just wanna give you an idea of, of, of how I uh, work things. Can we see this all right, Grace? Is that showing up all right? Yes, yes, I can okay. see it. So <laughs> this is an image. Now, none of these have left my raw processor at this point here. Um, what we're looking at here is my images in Capture One. I'm not going to push any software tonight. I'm not going to uh, explain how to do things because we all do things in our own software differently. But I'm going to point out areas that perhaps you should consider uh, when you are looking at an image. So just to give you an idea, what we're looking at here is how I envisage this scene. So in my mind's eye, how I was looking at the scene. However, that is what the, cap the camera captured. So I approach my work systematically. And if we have a look over here on the um, left-hand side of the screen, you'll see my, my layers palette here. And if I turn them all off, 
and I'll go through them one by one and, and show what I've done. So initially, my first uh, adjustment was to do some highlight and shadow adjustment. So if I just hit my option, hang on, I'll take that out there, sorry. If I just hold my option key down, so my first thing to do was to do was to just bring in my highlights, bring some white into the sky and darken my shadows a little bit. That was my first step. Once I did that, I added a sky and in the sky layer, I just changed the exposure a little bit. So I just made that, brought the sky in a little bit. Okay, it looks a little bit heavy now, but because I'm working in layers, I can always come back and address them. But what I saw looking at this, at this image was this beautiful light flooding through this valley. And I really wanted that to be where the eye was, was brought. So I then did my next layer, which was to bring some light into the valley. Now that valley was full of mist, uh, which, which we don't see that often here in Melbourne at the moment, um, but it was misty everywhere. And that was something that really intrigued me. So I wanted to try and make this photo um, represent how I felt when I was standing there. I felt I was looking at, a, at an oil painting of, of an Australian landscape. In the foreground uh, here, I, where I, what have I done here? I actually don't think that layer does anything by the looks of it. Something I did, but didn't, didn't use. Okay, so the trees here I felt were a little bit dark. So I just created a little mask and brighten those areas very, very subtly. When I say add a little mask in this software, I can just paint in, if you have a look where it's red, where I want to adjust. And all I've done there is played around with my highlights and shadows and exposure and contrast to bring that out a little bit. So if I turn that on and off, you can just see, it just gives me a little bit more definition in the trees. Also um, lessens the effect of what I've, what I've brought through the foreground. And the last thing I did was, there was this distracting stick in the front here that I thought was detracting from, from the overall composition. So I did a heel layer to remove that. So that's just very, very simply a way uh, that I would approach an image. So my purpose is to, where, uh, is to bring attention to where I want my viewer to look, what I want to accentuate in the frame, and to do that by using highlight, shadow, depth of field, cropping, composition, whatever, whatever it may be, whatever tools I have, to try and deliver that sort of uh, end result that's going to direct the viewer's eye to where I want them to look. So that's just a little bit of philosophy as to how I approach images. I'm going to go down now and have a look at the images that have been selected um, that you guys have sent in rather. So I must say before I even start, um, I was a little bit overwhelmed at the quality of the image. The, the, most of them are very, very good and don't need a lot of work. The thing, that, these, were, these, these images belong to Alison. So what I will do, Alison, is I'll just pick one of them at this stage and talk about it. And if we get time, we can, we can come back to, to the others. I think the composition here is really strong. If we look at the raw image, it is actually a crop. I actually think the crop's really working. It's giving us a leading line. It's a couple of things that I would do differently in this frame, uh, in this shot. The first one is we're losing um, a lot of detail in the sky here when we're looking into the sun. That can actually be retained if we, if we use our highlight recovery tool just very, very quickly to show you. Um, this is available in Adobe Camera Raw, in Lightroom or in Capture One. I'm pretty sure it's available in Affinity Photo as well, but we can actually pull the highlights in to try and bring more detail out in there so that it's not just a solid spot of, of one solid colour so that we have a little bit of texture. Shooting straight into the sun, of course, is going to do that, um, but we want to retain as much as we can. So that's one thing I would consider uh, would improve this. The other thing is the little bit of haloing over the rocks here okay, is, is a telltale sign that it's, that, it, that it's been through image processing of some description. So I would work at, at trying to avoid that happening. 
I would do that by working in, um, in the raw version of the file. So if we pull the, the shadows up, you can see I can pull the shadows up here, but I'm not getting any haloing around the rocks. And I can play with the highlights. And if you're not sure, you can do things like use, I'm gonna do a, a graduated vignette here. Um, if you're using Lightroom, uh, Allison or, or Capture One, I'll just show that mask. See how it's a, it's a graduated mask? What that means is we will avoid getting any halos if we start playing around with that sky. So I can pull that in, but we won't get any halos around the around the, the rocks there, which, which, which are a telltale sign that's been played with in Photoshop. But that then gives us the ability to, to play around with that sky. We can add some clarity and some texture to it. Uh, we can add some saturation to it. We can do whatever we want. But that's something that I would, I would consider looking at. If, if this was my image. The, the, the other thing I would suggest is that you perhaps hold back a little bit on the saturation. People tend to oversaturate their images. This is, I must admit, a, a personal uh, opinion of mine. I know other people really like it. I like to keep things a little bit more subtle. So I think that that yellow in the sky and the purple in the clouds is just making it look a little more, un, a little unrealistic. So I'd perhaps tone the saturation down and look at getting rid of the blue cast in the white water. So my mind tells me that that water should be white, but it has a, a blue cast. I think the potential is there. The, it's a very strong image. With some minor tweaks, you could make something really, really good of that, Alison. Uh, I shouldn't say that because it's really good as it is. You could make it even better is probably a better way of putting it. Do you have any questions on that, Alison, before we move on to the next one? No? Okay. So we'll move on to the next one here. So we have a before and an after. Oh, no. So there's nothing done to that. I'll turn that tool off if I could find it. Just bear with me. So I'm not sure whose these are. It's just coming up as audience files. So I think, I think the capture is very good. I think you've really captured a nice aspect of, of the kangaroo or the, or the wallaby. It's working really, really well. My only suggestion here would be to consider your angle of view, getting up a little bit higher or lower to try and avoid this line going through, through the head. And perhaps consider more space around the, around the subject as well, because the space can really give us, tell us a story about the environment tell us a story about you know where this where this animal's living what it's doing there and it's great as a wildlife shot nature shot where we want to look at the at the kangaroo absolutely um, but I think a little bit more space would would actually add to this image even if we just shot it as a landscape but kept the height the same in the frame but had a little bit left and right perhaps the the rest of the tail and so forth but other than that it's a very good capture We've caught a great moment with the joey poking its head out. And sometimes these moments uh, present themselves to us and we don't have a lot of time to think too much about the composition, but in the perfect world we would, and that's possibly something I would consider would take this to, to another level. Um, if the photographer's online, do you have any questions you'd like to ask me about that? No. Now, I'm not sure if all of these are from the same person, but they are all NEF files. So, so we'll go to this one. I actually think this is a pretty good edit of this, of this file. Not 100% sure about the, um, the panoramic crop. I think it, it is working, but I'm not sure if it's the best the best solution for this file. I think we've got some nice stuff happening in here with the sheep. So I would, I would for this one, I, there's not a lot I would do to this actually, other than perhaps consider a recrop. I, you know, maybe panoramic, but not, not quite as aggressively panoramic as what we're looking at here. I've just got to try and find my tools. They're all hidden behind the, 
thing. So that is quite a wide panoramic. But if I just go unconstrained, if we sort of had a bit more foreground, maybe kept it in the one thirds there. I'm not talking much. Just a little bit more space there. It's not a huge amount. But I think that would that would add to this image as well. All right, we've got lovely detail in the blacks, which is good. So I can see straight through. I can see something happening through the mist there. That's in, you know, that's quite intriguing. Another another trick, um, or not a trick, but another another way of looking at files is when when I used to enter the photography awards. You know, someone once said to me, "What you need to do is you need to put your photograph upside down and look at it upside down." And the reason we do that is so that we can look at it um, out of context and look at what is dragging our eye. I'll just, I'll just have a look here. I'll just, uh, just need to add something to my toolbar. Just bear with me for a moment. So if I look at that upside down, I've picked this one, but where is our eye going? It's going straight to this highlight. All right, now that light is beautiful, but is that what we want the people to be looking at? So that, that might, can, might um, ultimately determine how you end up cropping it. So as much as that light is beautiful, if you really want them to be looking at the sheep, maybe just a hint of that God light coming in the edge of the frame without that really hard hotspot might be a better option. Subjective, um, there are things you could do to bring those highlights out, um, playing around with the raw file, trying to bring the, the whites out, adding some, um, bring some shadow detail, pull some highlights in to really bring the rays out, just to tone it down a little bit. But a good capture on a lovely morning by the looks of things. Uh, does the photographer have any questions they'd like to, to ask? in regards to this image. Ian, um, I think there's two questions for it. Yep. So, Meg, so Meg asked, is there too much noise in this final image? And Kai asked, can space be added around a photo? Um, space can be added around a photo, but you need to have something to put in there. So my suggestion, uh, which I will tell anyone that wants to listen to me, is that it's always best to get it right in camera. So I, I teach my students at Swinburne Uni uh, to really think before they shoot. And I've created a document that, that says, is good really good enough? And I did that in response to my students saying, oh, it's good enough. And I go, well, is good really good enough? And, and the questions that I put in this little document, and I said, I want you to put this in your camera bags and take it with you. Because a lot of us shoot off the hip and don't necessarily really consider all the elements that are taking place. So, so there's, a, there's a couple of things. First thing is framing. What do I want to leave in and what do I want to crop out? Much better to do that in camera if you can. Now, of course, there are situations where you can't do that because you can't physically stand and you don't have the right focal length lens to get what you need from where you are, all those sorts of things. But wherever possible, that's really, really important. Second uh, thing I say is, is, that, is it the best lens that I have for this? Do I want to shoot with a wider lens and, and actually physically moving closer to exaggerate scale? Or do I want to step further back and shoot with a longer lens? Will that actually you know, soften the background or, or compress the background to give it a different effect? Then there's, where do I stand? You know, What's the best viewpoint? Do I lie on my belly on the ground to make the sheep look really big uh, above me? Or do I stand up high? You know, All of these things need to go through our mind when we're shooting. Now, there's no right or wrong answers to any of these. Next thing is, is what compositional rule do I try and apply to this image? Or is there one that, that I can apply to this image? And then if there is, would it be a better image if I broke that rule? You know, these are all things that go through my head uh, in a millisecond. And it's something that you have to train and you can only do that via shooting. So my suggestion would be rather than try and add it in, uh, it's always better to try and get it right when you're there. Uh, zoom out a little bit. Think about your rule of thirds, your Fibonacci spirals, your golden spiral, negative space, all of those things when you're shooting. And if you consistently shoot and shoot regularly with that in your mind, your photography will improve. And there's, there's no way to improve your photography if you take one photograph here, 
wait a couple of weeks and take another one. It's constant shooting and constantly assessing what you're shooting when you shoot it. Um, that will improve it. And also not just taking one shot, you know, like keep shooting because those sheep might've moved into a different position that was even better if you had it just waited there. Um, I, I'm sorry to the photographer, I'm just using yours as an example, but I'm just talking generically here. So yeah, so I would suggest that you try and think about that when you're shooting. Now, the other question was, was there too much noise in the file? Um, I'm looking at that at 100% on my screen, and I don't know if you can see it on your screen. I'll go to full full screen mode here. There is some noise in there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's too much, okay? Again, noise is subjective. I was away with the photographer, uh, one of the photographers last week, and we were talking about clean files. And this is a very, very highly regarded um, Sydney-based photographer who told me he puts noise in every photograph. So don't be afraid of noise if you like it. Okay, but have a reason for putting it in. All right, I'll just go back again. I'm assuming these are all different uh, photographers. I did have a, a quick look through most of them yesterday. I really love this scene, but again, I think the cropping's letting it down. I think it, it's actually a far stronger image uncropped if we look at the raw file here. I love the layering of this file. Um, I actually think it works really well. You've got the horizon almost perfectly straight. Um, all, all we need to do is really just play around with the exposure a little bit. And I think we have a really, really strong image here. I don't, I don't believe it, it, it needs such aggressive cropping. It's telling a real story to me. The, the fact that we're not cropping it is, is giving me all this space. It's giving me this sense of space that just goes on forever. And we've got these two little figures in here enjoying it. And it's layered from the, from the foreground to the sand, to the water, to the wave, to the open sea, to the sky. It's just all working really well. So a lot of people like to crop things panoramic. Um, my preference is actually a square crop, but only provided it works. Panoramics are fantastic if the image demands a panoramic, but not all images demand a panoramic. And just putting that crop on it for the sake of doing it can sometimes actually really detract from an image. And I think what we have here is a beautiful image uncropped. I think the, the cropping just detracts from it. In my opinion, um, I think it's a little flat and I see where the photographer has been going with the saturation. I would suggest you've perhaps taken it just a little bit too far. If you're working in a raw converter, you can just go back and pull that saturation back a little bit. If it's in uh, Photoshop, I'd suggest whenever you do something like this, you do it as, a, as a, an adjustment layer that you can actually go back and revisit when you've had a think about it. Another thing, you'll notice that I keep going to full screen um, because I find taking all tools and all distractions away from the image actually gives you a much better feel for the image. Sometimes it's too cluttered and around the image. I think a clear head and you look at the image on a screen like that, I wouldn't normally have it on white. I'd probably have it on a medium gray, like a mid-tone gray, which doesn't clash with anything. Uh, hang on. And then I would look at the images there like so. But I actually think this is a really beautiful image. I quite like the fact of the layers and this, this lady walking the dog just, just finishes it off beautifully. Any questions on that image? Okay, I'll just keep chugging along here and I will get to, to this image here. So we have a, a JPEG and we have a raw file and they're not too different from each other. Um, we've straightened the sign, uh, the sign here. I would suggest that the un, um, unrotated is probably more correct because the sign is actually on an angle moving away from us. So things I'd watch out for are blown out highlights. So it's quite a nice capture of the autumn tones. We need to think about what we're wanting to look at in this image. And at the moment, the right hand side of the frame is really, really bright and dragging the eye away from what I'm assuming the photographer wants us to look at is these beautiful autumn tones and, uh, and sign and grass and that here. So we could tackle that a couple of ways. 
if you really wanted to leave that in, if that, if that was something that you felt was really important, we can just simply pull in the highlights, okay? So that, so that it's not too bright, not dragging our eye out too much. Or we could reconsider the crop. And again, there are, there are different schools of thought on cropping. Some people believe that you should crop in camera and not crop at all. Others believe that, you know, what right do camera companies have to tell us how we need to crop the images? So I actually am a little bit in both. I think it's photojournalism. Uh, trying to capture it in camera is a good thing. But if we're talking fine art or decorative art, then it's free for all. You can, you can do whatever you want. But I would think even, you know, cropping some of that out of the side there makes it a strong, stronger image. Even if we could just retouch that car out. I don't know if we'll be able to do it here very quickly. But um, possibly, I'll just have a look. It's probably going to be a disaster, but we'll just have a look. It's a disaster. So I'd probably do that in Photoshop rather than a raw converter and, and duplicate that. But I think if we took that car out of the scene, even the one at the back there, it makes a much stronger image because we're, we're lessening the distractions that are dragging our eye away from the focal point of this image. But beautifully exposed, it's a great image. Um, there's plenty of detail in there. So all very, very good. Does the, this photographer have any, any questions they'd like to ask? No? Okay, we'll go to the next one. And we've already talked about this image earlier on. So I will move on to our next photographer, Brent Flavel. So here, here's a classic example of where a panoramic really, really works. And you've se you see this shot regularly as a panoramic. And there's probably not much I would have done differently to this shot, Brett, to be, Brent, to be perfectly honest. I think you've handled it really well. The only thing I would possibly have done is had, is had not, um, not as quite an aggressive crop. I'd like to see that, that fence just lead me in a little bit more. You know, maybe bring it into the corner of the frame there a little bit more. So that there is still a panoramic, all right? However, I feel it just has a lot more grounding because of the, uh, the fence leading us, leading us right in. The other thing again is the saturation. Now, again, it's just a, a personal thing. I'm not a big fan of images that are really oversaturated. I know some of the well-known landscape photographers do do that. Uh, I, I, prefer to see it a little bit more realistic or even in black and white. So it's totally unrealistic, but more for an effect. Um, what, I, what, I can all, what I also find is a lot of people oversaturate their images because their screens aren't displaying the color correctly. So having your color management set up in Photoshop, uh, in your editing software, Capture One, Lightroom or whatever, so that it's actually viewing the, <clears throat> displaying the colors properly is really, really important, which is uh, part of the reason we're here. BenQ monitors calibrate beautifully. So what you see on the screen is really uh, what the color that resides in the file. Now, unfortunately, I'm just doing this on a little MacBook uh, Pro tonight. So the colors that I'm seeing here, even though I've calibrated it, might be exaggerated too. So please don't take anything to heart that I say tonight, but I think, um, as a rule, people tend to oversaturate. I tend to prefer to see them a little bit less saturated. Uh, like increasing the saturation a bit is okay, but playing around with things like localized contrast. Now, localized contrast is tools like clarity or vibrance, where we can sort of bring out some punch and some depth in the file without actually uh, increasing the saturation too much. All right, so that, that would be my suggestion with this one. But I think it's a beautiful image captured well. Uh, you've got all the information in the file. It's just a, a few minor tweaks if you, um, if you agree with me. Um, if not, don't. That's fine. It's entirely up to you as it is subjective. But that's very good. Does Brent have anything he wants to ask me while I have his image up? Sorry. Take it, that's a no. I've never been to oh, great. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Ian. Um, so Brett asked in the chat, is there an ideal panoramic um, scale slash ratio? There's probably not. If you're looking at cameras, there's, um, 
when 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 you're actually buying panoramic cameras that that shot in panoramic like panoramic format, there was six by twelve crop, there was a six by seventeen, and there was six by nineteen. Um, but it's really up to you, you know. I don't I don't think we need to stick stick to rules like that. If if it makes the image work, um, then then go for it. Um, do you know what the scale was of the of the crop that you created, Brent? Off the top of your head, what the uh, the ratio was? You said three to one. Three to one. So if I do a crop here, three to one for argument's sake, and I'll do it on the raw file, right, and I'll just push that up. I would just drop your crop a little bit, just to get more of the fence in in the foreground. I just. You know, if, if you like that format and it works beautifully like that, I just like the idea of this fence leading us in. And then as we go past, we see the hut on the right, but it's leading us to the beautiful mountains in the background. It's just a way of, of leading the viewer's eye in through the photograph. But a great image. All right, I'll move on to the next one. What a great spot. Wish I was there. So I had a look at this one, and I actually think you've done a, a really good job of that, converting it. And I'm just going to have a little play, just a couple of things that I would like to, uh, that I would address if I had taken this image, uh, or if I was asked to edit it the way I would like to edit. I just need to get on the right tab. So the white balance is the first one. It looks to me like You've possibly added a tungsten white balance to that. I could be wrong. I'll just check that. Uh, nope. Oh. So I'll just I'll just pull it in. So I'm just working with the raw. So there's a couple of things. I feel the highlights. I uh, know oh they're not too bad. I must have been looking at the raw file, but I'd pull the. What's happened to that blue that I had in there? I'd pull the highlights in a little bit. Right, to try and bring in some detail. I'd probably open the shadows a little bit so that we, we see a little bit more in the boats rather than having these black holes. I'd open them up a little bit. So the beauty of the shadow slider is we can open the shadows. The problem with the shadow slider is we then lose our blacks. So what I would suggest you do then is grab the, the, the black slider and then add some blacks back into it. But just watch the point, if we look down here, so that we can still see some detail in the boat. I think that's really, really important. Now, I do realize we lose the overall effect of the sky, but we can, we can actually treat that differently. And I'm not, I'm not really finessing here. I'm just giving you ideas, but we could go through and we could treat that totally differently by, by bringing a sky in darker like that. What I'd like to see is just a little bit more detail. So what we try to avoid is this blocking up of the blacks. And I might even be able to just do it in your, in your JPEG there. If we just go with the JPEG, just something like that, that just, just lets us, you know, explore into the shadows a little bit more rather than just get to the shadows and it's solid black and then move on to something else in the frame. Our eye likes to rest in these areas and really sort of explore these little areas and look for bits of detail and so forth. In actual fact, that's all I do to it, to be perfectly honest. I've gone to the JPEG here. Um, sorry, what was, what was your name? Brett, I've gone to the JPEG here. And all I've done to the JPEG is just slightly um, adjusted the shadows. And I think that's just lifted it uh, incredibly. What it's done too, it's accentuated a lot of the shards of light that, that, that weren't quite as obvious beforehand, but a great capture. Again, you could crop this to a panoramic, but I quite like the space of the sky and the light going up into the sky. So I probably wouldn't do much more to it. Any questions, Brett? No? Okay, we'll move on. So beautiful sunsets. Okay. Let's have a look. So we've got two here. I'll just I'll just pick one. I think I think this is actually treated very very well. Um, these are the sorts of colours we do see in the sunset. So when we're there, and sometimes we do need to saturate them. So 
my comment on saturation is to try and keep it looking natural. Now, to me, a sunset like this actually looks quite natural. My only concern would be, is that horizon line straight? Would that actually fix it up? It is, it's an optical illusion by the looks of things. That one doesn't need much work at all. I actually think that's a great capture and it's been handled really, really well. We've got leading lines leading us into it. Yeah, the, what would be nice is if there was someone walking on the beach or something to add it, you know, add some sort of, uh, you know, scale or story or narrative to it. But even without that, it, aesthetically, it's just a beautiful image. You know, it's a good scene on a beach at sunset. So it's very, very nice. We'll look at the next one here. So we've got the fog and the crop here. I'll just have a look. I'll just bring this up. What am I doing? Um, now for something like this, I think sharpness is really, really important. Again, I think the crop, I think it's been cropped a little bit too aggressively. I'd like to get more of a sense of, of, of of place and I think it's actually working probably better uncropped than cropped. If you did want to crop it, um, maybe oh, I'll just change that back to original. You know, maybe just not quite as aggressive as what we have here would be good. So I'd be looking at something like that. Um, maybe try and get the composition so that tree's not right in the center. Okay, but but have trees either side of it that just give it a little bit more sense of space. I would look at trying to bring some detail out of that sky. We can do that with our highlight slider. And then we can add white back into it to, because it, 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 it wouldn't be like that. We can even add some clarity into the sky and that to try and bring it out. That would work really well. Um, this area here in the foreground could could benefit with a bit of treatment. So you may want to select an area in the middle there. And again, I'm doing this very roughly and very, very quickly, but what I'm doing here is I'm creating a radial mask. If I hit my mask, you can just see there and I can, I can change the, the fall off of that mask. I'm pretty sure that Lightroom does this. If there's any Lightroom users online that could answer that, that would be good. I'm pretty sure it does. So I do that, then, then what we have is we have isolated now an area where I can actually start playing around with, you know, to try and maybe increase the saturation a little bit, um, play around with the highlight and the shadow, you know, play around with it to try and create more layering between the image, uh, between the layers. I'd possibly do a similar thing with the sky. You know, just pull the sky in a little bit, a little bit more highlight in the sky, a bit more white. The important thing is, is that we don't make it too muddy. So first thing we should check is our levels, get our white point right. And it's starting to come to life now, but what I'll do is I'd work the layers. So the foreground here, the mid ground here and the background to try and make our eye explore through the frame. But that, that again is a really, a really nice capture. There's some lovely cloud in the sky here that you could really play with. So that adjustment layer there with the sky, I've stupidly added it to the one from before. So I'll do another one in the sky. And uh, actually no, one, I'll just delete that. But just playing with the saturation in the sky there could, you know, could quite work the hue and saturation. Now playing around with the contrast, the clarity. I quite like, you know, where we're going here at the moment where it's quite pastel -y. An image like this, I might, you know, I might disregard initially and come back and play with it and, and I'll try different things, you know. The beauty of having a raw file is that we can try many different, different interpretations and, and see which one works the best. But there's definitely content there that, that could work. I'd be exploring the layers and trying to bring out the whites in the foreground in the sky here. So I'll do that just very quickly. Sorry, in the mist, I should say. I'll just I'll just do that in here. Okay. 
think I've actually, I've got a new layer. Now I'll try it in here. Why is it doing that? Okay, I'm not gonna do it like that. I'm gonna do it with a radial because it's not working for me. Just get a radial one through the middle here. And just try and bring some white, you know, out of those, um, out of the mist in there. So if we grab that and just go to our high dynamic range tool. Just try and bring that, that mist out a little bit more to really try and show some definition, some, uh, I suppose, definite differences in the stages of the image, the layers of the image. At all times, trying to keep it looking realistic though. So that just pops a little bit more when we bring out the white cloud here and the, I haven't really done what I wanted to do with that foreground, but um, I try and do most of what I do in my raw process, but there's some things that are better suited to, to uh, Photoshop, that's up to you, but it just experiment with the layering and remembering at all times where you want the viewer to look. So where do you want, where do you want the viewer's eye to go through the front? So when you were standing there looking at this, what was it that made you photograph this? And what was it you wanted to show the people that are looking at this photograph? Once you've identified that, use your techniques to direct the eye there. And that, that could be, you know, like vignetting. It could be, um, you know, darken the edges a little bit to try and bring the eye more to the center to that tree. Um, it could be just increasing the saturation on the tree a little bit and reducing it everywhere else. There's a number of things you could do to this. Any questions on that one? Kai just asked which, uh, which processing unit is being used? What software am I using? What, uh, which processing unit? I'm not sure what, what you mean by that. Is it? What processing unit? I'm not sure. Are you able to elaborate on that, Craig? Sorry. Uh, I'm not too sure about that. He, he just um, asked that question in the, the chat. Okay, so I'm using... If it, oh, yes, software, software. Software, yeah. So I'm using Capture One, which is by Phase, phase One. I've been using this. I discovered I had a clean out in the studio uh, fortnight ago and I found my very first disc. So I've been using Capture One since version 1.1. 1 .1. We're now up to version 22. Uh, I swear by it. I, I don't believe there is a better all-round raw processor on the market, but unfortunately, it is an additional cost. So Lightroom will do pretty much everything that this does. I just think this does it with a little bit more finesse. So um, yeah, it's Capture One and it's totally customizable. So I can totally customize the workflow to suit the way I work, which I don't have it at the moment customized. All right, let's go to the next one. So no more questions, Craig? Nope. Okay, let's have a look at these. Okay, I'm going to just pick one. Overall, just looking at them overall, you've 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 pretty much done a great job of all of them. Yeah, I quite I quite like pretty much everything you've done to all of these images. Um, I'll turn that off. Sorry. So I don't know how much is in the raw file, but. I'm, I'm a real stickler for being able to see into the shadows. So if anything, I would look at exploring that a little bit more, if you can. And because we can do this in layers, we don't necessarily have to do it to the entire picture. I could just grab a brush and just brush through the middle there and just lift the shadows in that area only. So it's not affecting the sky or anything, just to make it a little bit more, a little bit more mysterious. So we don't have, you know, I'm not talking about blatantly drag your eye in there. We can see every bit of detail, but just so that we can see that there's something in there and 
get a bit of a hint. You know how when your eyes adjust to the dark, you go outside initially and every, you, you can't see anything, but then your eyes adjust and you can start to see outlines and, and things like that. That's the sort of level I'm looking at. But I think that's working really well because... I think maybe with the exposure, we could just bring it up a little bit. I'm really, look, I'm really um, clutching at straws with this one. I think it's actually been handled really, really well to start with. Okay, we've got detail in the moon, probably a little bit too much. The moon being the light source is starting to look a little bit muddy. So I'd probably um, bring the detail in, but not quite as much as what you've got there. Just. You know, keep it looking luminant. So maybe something more like that. I don't know if you can see that on your screen. If I go, uh, where am I? If I just go before and after. So it's just looking a little bit flat and muddy there. And when we do that, it's just lifting and it's still looking like a luminant light source that's lighting the frame. It's about all I do to that one. I'm not even going to begin to critique this because I'm just, you know, like blown away that you guys photograph this stuff like this and, and make it look so good. I've been out playing with it. And I think the important part of an image like this is that you actually have a shot um, that's not just about the stars. It tells a little bit more of a story. And I think that you, you've got that here. I think that's working really well with the, with the water scene and the tree and the stars. And so I think that's been handled really well. Beautifully sharp, lovely detail in there. So that's really good. That one, I think you've done pretty well with that. Yeah, my, my um, remark from earlier would be the same here. Just open up those shadows a little bit. I'll just try it with the JPEG here if we can do it. doing it to everything. So I would possibly brush a layer in here. The reason I try and do as much as I can in the raw processing software is because you end up with a much better file to take into Photoshop. Once we've, once we've put this into Photoshop, we've converted the Bayer uh, data, if you like, into pixels that have a defined value. So whatever we do from that point on in Photoshop, we're actually degrading the file. But if we get if we do this here, we're actually bringing into Photoshop something that that actually has full data integrity. So it's going to give us the most tonality we can possibly get. And what that means in real terms is if I try to do try to lift this in Photoshop, I'm working on the JPEG here. Um, it obviously has to be the raw file. If I try to do that in Photoshop, I'm going to introduce noise. But if I do it here in the raw file with the raw file here, I'll bring the whole exposure down to get the sky, you know, roughly where I'd like it to be. And I can just go in and I can open the shadows. I can also do a layer like I, like I just said with the JPEG, just bring it through the middle here. So maybe I'm going to leave the foreground in this instance because that's it's nice and dark. It's leading us into the frame. I can just bring out some detail in there. But if we look at it, it will actually be very, very clean in compared, you know, compared to the file if we try to do that in Photoshop later. Now, it's a really, really good idea to do whatever you can possibly do to the file in your raw converter, whether it's Adobe Camera Raw, Lightroom, Capture One, they all pretty much have the same or very, very similar uh, suites of tools that will do very, very similar things. So, so just get used to the tools within your raw converter and try and get the file looking as close as you possibly can in your raw converter before processing it out. And it's very tempting not to do that and just do it in Photoshop because you know Photoshop, but I really encourage you to persist and learn how to get the most out of your raw converter because your files will, will be significantly better if you do, if you do work that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions, Dave? Anything in particular about these images that, that you would like um, me, to, me to talk to? Or um, There's some questions from other viewers. Yeah, yeah. So okay. is Lightroom also pixel-based or is it a raw processor? No, so, so Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw are pretty much the same raw processor. It's just that in Photoshop, 
the interface is different to Lightroom. So Lightroom is a much more elaborate interface than Adobe Camera Raw, but they both will process a raw file the same way. They use the same engine. And what they do is they take the data from the camera and they convert it to, to pixels. And for argument's sake, if we had a JPEG, if I took this JPEG, I don't know if it's gonna do it in, in this software. I'll just have a look. Let me have a look here. No, it's not, it's not gonna do it. But essentially, if we look at our histogram here on the, on the side of the screen here, I'll, I'll see if I can make it bigger for you. No, it's not gonna allow me in Zoom. But if you see this, this area here, in the JPEG or a TIFF file or a process file where we already have pixels, everything past this point of 255, like say 255, 256 onwards, there is absolutely nothing there. And likewise from zero to minus one, minus two, there is nothing there. Because we've given those pixels a value and we've thrown everything else away. So what we use is a rendering engine or raw processing software. And we have about three stops of information either side of that histogram. So for argument's sake, if you're underexposed by a stop and you've got a JPEG, to pull that data out is very difficult because there's no data or information there to give you the detail in the shadows. But your raw file has captured it and it's sitting on the other side of the histogram. So if we just look at the exposure tool here and we look at the histogram up the top, Actually, I'm on a layer, sorry. I'll just go back. I'll go here. So if we look at the histogram, I'll just move, I'll just move the levels up so you can see this histogram here. Okay, so it's directly above my exposure. So if we're looking at this histogram here, I can move it. See how the, all the information's moving up and all the information's moving down. So what it's doing is if, if I find it, I'll see if I can find a shot which is which is has a lot more underexposure to it. Um, so here's here's one. They're actually all exposed very well. But see this here on the edge of the histogram. In a JPEG, if I use the exposure tool, we'll end up with a straight line there that will come up, and there's no information past it. But in a raw file, as I lift it, you'll see there's just it keeps extracting information out of there. And if we look at the file, you know, it's still fairly clean. If we look in the foreground in the shadows, there's not a lot of noise. We can see through into the water because there is information there that's been recorded that's been thrown away in a processed file. So if we do it in the raw software, we are able to determine what value we want to give those pixels so that when we bring it into Photoshop, they're correct and all the information required for that for that tonal range is there. If we don't do that in the raw processing software and we bring it into, into Photoshop, we've already given it a number. So what we're doing is we're trying to adjust it from a much more limited range of tonality than what we had before we processed it out of the raw software. I hope that makes sense to you. But at the end of the day, if you just live by the rule that do whatever you can in the raw software um, and you'll get the best result. Can also work in a higher bit depth, which is a whole other a whole other story. Any other questions there? Um, yes. So Kai also asked, "What do you think about composites as an as in adding an element where there isn't one?" I don't have a problem with it. Um, it's not something I do as a rule. And there's a very famous photographer I'm sure you've all heard of called Elliot Irwin, and uh, he was asked this question when he was in Australia about 10, 15 years ago. And he answered it very, very well. He said, I don't care. As long as I know when I'm looking at it, that it's a composite or, um, or not. And what I mean by that is there's obvious composites where you look at it and it's just, it looks like fantasy. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. It's not my taste. It's not something I do, but for those that do it, it's very, very popular. And there are people that do an amazing job of it and create wonderful creations that are quite obviously fantasy. So you don't need to be told, but if, if I'm looking at photojournalism, I'd think it's a real no-no, you know, that I'm being told that this photo is real 
um, because it's in the newspaper and it's photojournalistic, but elements have been added. So I think I think either is good. Okay, I remove objects. I don't often add objects in. In actual fact, I'd say I've probably only done it in my personal like landscape work, maybe once in my entire career. And it's I, I had a shot of um, the mayor building in London next to the Tower Bridge, which um, I think Brent had or Brett had earlier. Um, and the sky was a bit boring, so I dropped some birds in. And it's the only time I've done it. I don't do it as a rule. I try and get it in camera. But no, I don't have a problem with it at all. You know, photography is an art form. You know, it's a, it's a bit like saying, you know, what do you think of uh, cubism? There are, you know, photorealist painters that, that, that want it to look, you know, real and like photographic. There are impressionist painters and there's cubist painters and people have taste. It's like music. Some people like classical. And there's a, there's a home for all styles of photography and no one should be able to tell you what you can and can't do. But if you like something, go for it. Heather, let's have a look at Heather's. Okay. All right. So I um, actually really quite like this. And this shot is all about colour. So the, the fact that the saturation has been pushed forward doesn't bother me in this instance. I think it's actually quite working. It's quite strong on the black background. I quite like the, the shallow depth of field. I have no doubt what I'm looking at. It's a flower of some description. And I think that that's working quite well. Tiff, on the other hand, I think, I think what we need to be aiming for is somewhere probably halfway in between the two. I really like the richness of the sky here, but the foreground I find is, is better in this one. And there's a very, very simple way of approaching it. And sometimes we... We do, put, and I do it too. And and, and I'll I'll do an image. I'll take a photograph of an, of something, and I'll work on the image, and then I'll come back and look at it the next day and think, what was I thinking? You know what I mean? Like, we can do that. And that's the beauty of having a raw file and doing it in layers. We can go back and revisit it, and we can just adjust it and do what we want. I think your ideal shot here, Heather, is somewhere in between, and I would think this one needs not much. You've actually, I'm looking at that raw file, and you've actually pretty much nailed it exposure wise if we look at the histogram and everything it's working quite well we just need to bring the shadows out a little bit to to reveal a little bit more of the foreground so if we just use the shadow slider all right that then has an effect on the background not quite as bad as that but has an effect but see how the sky is still really rich now i can keep those shadows open but then go and add black back in and it will bring it back to the point where it's starting to look a little bit more natural. So if I do a before and after on that one, we see the difference. It's only very, very subtle. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, fan of subtlety in photographs. All right, so we could then go through and say, okay, well, I wanna, just you know, do a do a mask over the sky and darken that off a little bit, you know. So I can go back and I can pull the, some shadowing back in the sky and bring the whites in, add some clarity, you know, try and bring some detail out in that sky. So we can do all of that, and then what we have is an image where we have this lovely, beautiful foreground detail. All right but we retain the beautiful rich blackness of the sky and the environment because the sky would be black. You could then even go in and start playing with your saturation and so forth if you wanted to really bring some colours out in that sky. Great capture. I like the composition. I love the, the where, where you've placed the tree in the frame. That's working really, really well. I think that um, if that was my image, I probably wouldn't do anything more to it than what, what I've seen there, what I've just done to it there. So just looking at the one here, if we look at our at our histogram here, um, it's just the blacks are, are not sitting in black. We can pull that back in by just, just pulling our black point in. So if we understand our histogram, this point here where my, if you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there, where my cursor is, is what represents black. So anything in the frame that should be pure black should be at this point in the histogram. 
but our blacks are right up here. So they're actually in a muddy gray. So if I bring my histogram up, I'm now saying those blacks should actually be down there. And I'm just bringing all that punch back into the file and that's working well as well. In actual fact, it's probably working a little bit better because we're getting this lovely Milky Way coming through the sky now. Any questions on that one? Heather. How are we going for time? Uh, we've hit the one hour mark, so you can, you can still go through the, the images and I've just right. noted down all the questions from the viewers and okay. I can email those straight to you after. All right, I'll go through, I'll try, I'll try and speed up a little bit. Um, this hangs together beautifully in the frame. I like the position of the bird. We've got viewing space. It's holding together really, really well. Um, as it stands, I think the, the photographer has cropped it well. I think the treatment is very good. The color's good, um, very vibrant. The detail in the feathers and the file is sensational. So what sort of camera was that taken with, uh, James? DNG, is that with a Leica or, or a Pentax? Or? The optics are very, very good anyway. Uh, there's not much more I'd do to that, to be perfectly honest. I think you've treated it really, really well. You've toned the background down so that it's not dominating. The bird is definitely the hero of the shot. <clears throat> you've placed it in the right side of the frame. I think that's working really well. Let's have a look here. Okay, so we'll have a look at a couple of things. So I'll just pick one just because we're running out of time. So let's pick this one here. So it's a few things that we could do to really lift this image. Okay, the first one, the really obvious one is the horizon. So that's a really, really easy thing to do. In uh, most programs, we have a horizon leveling tool where we put a line across the horizon and it just straightens the horizon. That's improved it out of sight even more. So that we could then look at a crop and we could play around with crops. Oops. You know, is there, is there something that, that, that's working a little bit better? So I'm thinking, you know, this rock in the foreground in the third of the frame could work really, really well. So let's have a look at the white balance. I think this, this white water in the foreground here is, you know, is really what we want to aim to be to have white. So I'm just going to stick the white balance tool on there and look at that. So I would then look at trying to bring a little bit more detail out of the rocks. And I'm not going to go into creating masks and that we're just starting to run out of time. So I would just perhaps pull out, the, pull out some detail in the rocks there. So what, what, what you can see us doing here, all this, all this uh, detail in the rock, I'm just brightening it up a little bit. So by using the shadow tool, you'll notice that the sea around it and the sky isn't changing. It's only working on the shadows in the file. So it's a little bit like dodging and burning, but it's a lot less destructive. So we could also perhaps look at trying to do some work to the sky. So I'm thinking if we looked at just increase, increasing the clarity in the sky to try and bring some more texture out of the sky, that could actually add to it. Add a little bit of contrast. And then if we bring our highlights in to bring some detail out of those clouds, but then bring our white point up. Okay, so if we have a look at what we've done there, it's just really, let's do a before and after is probably easy. So we've just taken the muddiness out of it. We've cleaned it up. We've just made it a little bit more punchy. And to finish off, I may just add something like a very subtle vignette around the edges to bring our eye into the center of the frame. But what we have here is we have some leading lines through into the frame to bring us to this little rock in the back there, which is our little point of view if we follow it through. Any questions on that one? All right, we'll go to the next one. Okay, so you're working along the lines of what I'd be doing with this. 
Um, I'll go to the raw file very, very quickly. I'll turn this off. I like the idea of trying to bring the highlights out and um, really accentuate the light that's coming through. So you can do that by, I always like to play with the high dynamic range tool, but I've now, I've rearranged my tools and now it's hidden um, because I can just isolate the highlights, brighten them and bring some whites into the highlights. Okay. This one could probably do with a little bit of saturation, but what I'd be aiming at doing is really trying to accentuate these areas. So I'll just do a couple of things. I'd say I'll go into here. So I really want to try and bring out that, and I'm doing it very, very roughly. So don't be too critical of the, uh, of the, um, of the masking that I'm doing. And so maybe we bring the shadows out in there as well and then bring the blacks. So that's what I'd be aiming at, is really trying to, to bring out the, the dappled light, the differences in the light. We could do that here in the foreground as well. We could try and bring some something out of the rock here. It's probably a bit too much rock, but we could play around with the shadow detail in, in the rock there just to try and bring it out a little bit. A bit of saturation in the rock. Right, and maybe play around with the crop. Maybe the, you know, the shot is something more like that, where we have the rock in the third, and this is creating a bit of a Fibonacci spiral for us. That seems that seems to work, but I think you're on the right track here, most definitely. So just play around with it, finesse it. What I do when I'm not sure, I, I just leave it on my screen and I look at it every day, and then I'll see new things in it that that add to it. And I find that if I have an image and it's still there after a week, it's a winner. Quite often I, I disregard them and it's okay not to like every photograph you take. Um, you know, I go away and I think, you know, I told you earlier, I went away last week and I've, I've come back with about six images of about a hundred that I took six images that I'm really, really happy with. But, um, you know, I see that as a really, really good strike rate. So it's okay to throw images out if you're not happy. Um, but before you do so, explore every, every, every avenue. See what you can do. Time of the day is really important too. So if you, can go, if you go to a location and it looks beautiful, is it going to look even better at a different time of the day? So um, when the sun's lower and we get the shards of light coming through the frame, it can make a big difference. So beautiful scene. Brighten these areas a little bit, add some contrast in there. I did... Get rid, of, get rid of that. So in this area here, I'll probably pull some blacks in. Wrong one. It's why you should always label your layers so you know what it is. So that's starting to look more realistic. What we want to avoid is it looking wishy-washy. You know, keep it looking punchy without looking, too, without looking blocked up, if that makes sense. So we need to have black and we need to have white, but what we don't want is mush where it's sort of off-white or, or dark gray and no detail. We want to have that definition in there, but definitely have blacks and whites in the frame. Any questions on that one? Beautiful spot. Beautiful spot. Again, just I would, I would look at just bringing those shadows out a little bit more. Uh, Catherine, I think it's working really well. What you've done here is really quite nice. Um, the beauty of your highlight and shadow recovery tool or high dynamic range tool, if you like, is that you can work on your highlights and your shadows independently. So I can bring that sky in. And to add contrast, I just bring white back into it. But then I can also open up my shadows to the point where probably going to need more. So I've done as much as I can in a single file. So we would need to do some layering here. And there's some, some great tools to allow you to do that. So for argument's sake, if I go back to zero on this one, there's a tool called the Luma tool. So if I grab my exposure tool first and foremost, 
Okay, I'm just looking at the shadows to see what sort of detail is in there. If I go to my shadow tool and look at that, I can go create a new filled layer in, um, in this software and then go to Luma range. Now, what, what that does is that, well, let me do it. It's doing funny things. I don't know whether it's Zoom. That will allow me to actually isolate certain tones within the frame that I want to work on. And I can feather them a lot more. I'll do it very, very roughly. So I can go into here. And I've now got my highlights on a separate layer and my shadows. So I can really pull them in. Then I can go back into here and really start working those shadow areas. All right, I'd suggest that we're probably going to need to do a, to do more of a mask, but but what I'm doing here, it's starting to get that HDR look, which is what I'm actually trying to avoid. So we need to bring some black back into it, which brings our contrast back, and we need to add some white into it. And I'm doing a ter terrible job of this in front of you guys here, um, but we probably need to revisit this again. Now I'm working with a single file here. There are, um, why is it doing that? There are programs where we can actually create multiple files to try and bring it out. I've probably gone a bit too far here. All right, so we can play around with it like that, but. Um, I'd just be trying to aim at getting that just a little bit brighter with a little bit more. This here is beautiful. This is working really, really well. Just check that horizon. Okay, I think that helps. All right, so I don't know how much is in the file to be able to extract out of there. So if I go back, if I just reset this one, Okay, so that's that's four stops um, exposure enhancement. It's probably a little underexposed to really bring much more detail out of that. So what you've done there is actually very, very good. What you can do is um, do a HDR in, in Photoshop or in a program like, um, what's the one that I used to use, Photomatics, and just create a series of these images where you change, so in Lightroom, Capture One, we can do new variants or clone variants. I should have done a clone variant. If I do a clone variant of this, I'll just delete that one. Right, so that will be at four stops over. Where is it? So if I make this one three, we clone it and we do two and we do it. And so we have, you know, maybe 10 frames and then bring it into HDR software, that would be a way of perhaps fixing it as well. Um, but that would be mine, is just try and get a bit more detail out of the shadow there without making it mushy. But perhaps your exposure is letting you down a little bit in this regard. Okay, but yeah, what you've done there is working really well. You've actually got a lot of detail out of there, which is great. The thing we need to know, this is the sharpest part of the frame. So we're being drawn into here. We, we sort of need to be able to see some detail. Any questions on that one? So probably, it, it probably goes back to my earlier comment of, of trying to get it right in camera. And there is a technique called shooting to the right. And it's really, really important. It's a really important rule to try and follow. On your camera, and I might, you know, looking at the standard of your work, most of you are probably aware of this, but I'll, I'll, I will say it just in case. But in the back of your camera, you have the ability to bring up a histogram on your viewfinder, on your LCD screen on the back. It's a really, really important tool because if we use the back of our screen as a gauge of the exposure, it's fraught with danger because the screens are designed to make the images look more punchy, um, to to look more vibrant than what they actually are. So 
you know, we think we've got a great exposure. You get back to your studio, you plug it into your computer and it's underexposed. So the idea is to look at your histogram and shooting to the right is trying to get the information as far to the right as you can without actually clipping, okay? So if I move this, you see the histograms going up there. If I, oh, that's the wrong one, sorry. I'll do it on this one. If I move the histogram up here to the point where it's, I've done it again, sorry. So this one here, if you look at the histogram, four stops brighter, okay, everything is still within the histogram, all right? It's just that it's very, very bright. Now, without complicating it too much, the least amount of information in a file resides in our shadow areas here. So if we overexpose the image without clipping, without blowing anything out, we're putting more information into our shadows, even if they look too bright. And what that means is when we actually darken them, there's a lot more information and a lot more detail in there to work with. So a good rule is shoot to the right, try and get all that information here to the right of the histogram without clipping, even if the image looks overexposed on the back of the camera. Because when you bring it into your raw processor, you can actually make it, data, uh, make it darker, but you have all this wonderful information or, or tonality that you're pushing back into the shadows rather than trying to extract it from the shadows when it isn't there. It's just a different way of thinking. So a lot of people uh, think that it needs to look right on the back of the camera, and that's just not the case. Um, I don't even look at it for anything other than composition. I know that if my histogram is sitting with all the information to the right, that I've got everything I need to get the most out of the file. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and again, any questions? I'm gonna to have to speed it up a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, we'll run out of time. So that is the original capture. And that is the crop, that's, that's done some really good things there. You've brought the detail back into the rocks, uh, which is really, really good. You've, you've gotten rid of the distraction here and you've really made it about, about that person. I'd suggest you could probably even make it more so, more dramatic, having more over to the side of the frame if there's, enough room or look at a, at a different crop that might that might give it a little bit more interest other than that there's really not much more i would do to this file it's actually working really well but i'm, I'm wondering whether something like like that might work work as a better crop and then if we go back to our highlight recovery bring the details back into the rocks and I'm sort of almost liking the fact that it's looking almost like a faded pastel, you know what I mean? And it's working, it's working quite well. There's some lovely detail in there. So something to think about. What you've done is fantastic, but there are other, other ways of looking at it. So square maybe, not, not the crop, but just have a play around with it. So three, four could be a, could be a good crop. Something like that. But I think you've done a, you've done a pretty good job of it, as it is. Lots of detail there. It tells a story. It's got a strong narrative to it, which is which is great. Uh, any questions, Ken? No, just before I move on to the next one, what, what could also work in a shot like this, if you had the chance to do it again, is actually including more of these people and showing the juxtapositioning of these Orthodox Jewish people with people just dressed in normal clothes, having a look at, you know, what's written on the wall and so forth as a bit of a, as a, bit of a um, story, you know, a bit of a tangent on, on what that wall means to many people. Some people are there for religious significance and others are tourists just come to have a look. That could also be quite a nice narrative as well. Lynn. Okay, I think, I think you've done a good job with this. A couple of things I would do. We've probably gone a little bit overboard with our highlight and shadow recovery, but it's not, 
it's not too far. So first thing I would do, this pillar in the front looks like it's leaning over to me. I'd make it straight. Okay, it's not much. And it's just looking a little bit too even. All right, so we're starting to get haloing on the side of the poles. Not too bad, but we're there. I would expect that what's in shadow here would actually be in shadow. So I would lift my exposure level up a little bit. And I'd probably look at something more like that where it's less wishy-washy, okay, but actually looks a little bit more realistic. I don't think you need to do much more to it than that, to be perfectly honest. If you wanted to bring the, the detail in the sky and you could possibly pull some highlights in a little bit and then bring some whites back. But that's probably more along the lines of where I think it should be in terms of, of exposure. And maybe a little bit more space around the window here wouldn't, wouldn't hurt either. I'll just get rid of this crop altogether. If it will let me. So I think that that circle window unbroken actually works really, really well. So it doesn't need much. You know, a lot of photos, sometimes we look at a photo and we think we need to do more to it than what we need to. But I'm thinking that's actually hanging together really, really well. I love being led down into this garden by the path. That's working really well. The light's leading me there. The fact that this is in the shade on this side of the frame, it's sort of sitting in the tonal range I'd expect it to be sitting because it is in shade. We could possibly add a little bit more contrast to the to the highlights and a bit more white maybe um, pull that exposure back just a little bit so that the highlights are a bit darker and then just increase open the shadows a little bit and put a bit of black in it's a case of just finessing it till you're happy with it but i think i think the big difference between the two of them is you know if, if you go if you cast your mind back there uh lynn when you were there, what color were these poles? I, I would imagine they were probably more a darker brown like this than what I'm seeing here. So I'm thinking, look, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking that that's holding together color wise a lot better than the one above. But a good capture, I really like it. It's a lovely, lovely image. Any questions? No, okay, I'll keep going. Okay, this is, uh, this would be really, it would be much stronger if we had the top of this arch of water in it. But I'm thinking because we don't, we need to probably look at, at how we can, you know, bring our eye to it more. At the moment, this sand's really, really fighting with this. So I'd probably look at, at darkening the sand off. So I'll go to here. And I would probably just darken the sand off so that it's not sort of jumping out into my face. So by making it a little bit darker in the foreground, it make, it drags our eye in to, to this water spray more than when it's, a lot, when it's brighter. It's sort of fighting with it there, but this is leading our eye in. We could probably add a little bit more black into that vignette. It's not having a lot of effect, but... All right, cropping. Cropping's always a good way of bringing interest to where we want it to be. I'll just keep it unconstrained, but maybe even just cropping out some of that. That's actually working quite well. A little bit of a vignette to bring our eye into the center. Sorry, I could get to it. Because I'm too down. You know, I'm thinking that this is this here in the center is the hero of the frame. So this is really where we want to be directing the eye. Fortunately, whatever I did then, I've I've ruined it. What have I done? What did I do to the I oh, know I didn't. 
So I'd be trying to just get the get those highlights to stand out a little bit more. Really bring some detail out in there. So that's I'd, that's what I do. I darken the foreground, play around with the crop a little bit. Maybe I know that's a bay at the back, but it, it is looking a little bit like the whole thing's leaning. So we could we could play around with the uh, with the angle of the of the sea in the background there. Straighten it out a little bit. I've gone too far. That would possibly work better. So misty, we would expect it to you know to be fairly to have you know, not to have a lot of contrast. And other, other things we need to really, really be careful of are things like these sensor spots. These here. I once entered a, 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 an image into the photography awards that I'd spent about three hours retouching sensor spots out of because my sensor was really, really dirty when I took the photograph and then went and entered the file with all the sensor spots into the awards and I was standing back when they were judging the print and they said this is unforgivable that a professional photographer would put something like this in with so many dust spots on it and I was horrified because I'd spent hours retouching them out only to discover that I'd basically submitted the wrong file but these are really really easy to get rid of um, I would quite often do this in photoshop using the the healing brush Okay, but we have a dust removable uh, dust removal tool in Capture One. Lightroom has it, and you can just click on them, and it should just make them go away. I don't, I'm not sure if that's dust down there or something in the frame, but it's very, very easy just to go through and just make sure that you take them out. It's very important because they can be really, really distracting, and they can be really, really costly. Um, and what I mean by that, I did a two metre by one metre print for a client today. And um, we're talking a print that's, you know, a few hundred dollars to produce. And there was a big dust spot in the middle of it. So it had to be printed again. Uh, dust spot as in in the file. I'm not sure what this yellow is here. Um, I'd be probably trying to get rid of that as well. This is why I'm having, I'm working on the wrong file. So I'll just do, I'll just bring that back to where it was. And we'll go back here, okay? So that's more like it. So just, Martin, just, I apologize for that. I've done that all to the file that you've worked on, but it's okay. So I'll bring the exposure down a little bit. I'll bring the highlights up a little bit. I'll oh, sorry, the shadows up a little bit. To try and get this happening in here. So we're trying to get detail in here. So if we look at the highlights, and then we bring whites back into the highlights. It's just the way you approach approach the file. We can sort of try and bring some stuff into there. We can add some clarity. Adding clarity will bring out more of the, if I change to a different type of clarity, it will bring out more of the detail in there. Um, again, you know, let's not oversaturate. If we have a look at this here, it's too golden. It's looking unreal. Um, I think, I think this is probably more where we want to be and then start darkening areas off. Again, it's about just directing the eye where you want the viewer to look. You know, maybe the overall exposure could come down a smidgen. Playing around with it like so. I, I like to keep it more realistic. Um, that, that is a personal personal choice our highlights are probably a bit too blown out there we can bring those in bring those in here all right but i'm thinking that's starting to look a little bit more realistic there with that light there but then we're being drawn into this this spray of water would have been nicer had we have and, and like you can't predict these things because they just happen so quickly but if we had had a little bit more space around the frame. But any questions on that one, Martin? Okay, aerials. 
So these to me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at the aerials. Well, they're all aerials. To me are about texture, texture of the landscape. I see so many aerials where they push the saturation uh, beyond belief. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. I suppose you really need to ask yourself what it is you're trying to portray. If you want to uh, shoot an aerial that's, that's, almost, that's abstract and you want to really play with the color, that's, that's great. Um, we can do that, hang that on the wall as, as a, an artwork. If you want to reproduce what it is you saw, what I like to do is, you know, what was it you felt when you were there and what is it you try and get out of, get out of it? So to me, these photos are about texture and that's what you've worked out here. You've, you're bringing texture out. So I'd be doing any treatment to these that works on bringing texture out. So, <coughs> excuse me. So again, highlight shadow gives us texture. So we can bring whites in. I'm not gonna, I've done it again. I'll go, I'll go back to this one. Okay, so we're shooting, shooting from a plane, I take it. <coughs> excuse me. So first thing, where is my levels tool? First thing we can do is put our whites where we think they should be and put our blacks where we think they should be. So that first step alone has improved and gotten rid of the, uh, the softness in it in terms of soft contrast I'm talking about. We can play with the contrast tool. Okay, that's gonna bring more texture out. We can also in something like Capture One, we can go in and we can isolate colors. I can go in and say, okay, I wanna, I wanna just saturate the pinks. I can, I can go to the pinks. I can say, okay, I want to just saturate the, the greens, but to a different amount. I can play around with it to bring different colors out. So I, th I think the shot's working as it is, but to take it to the next level, I would play with trying to bring those textures and differences of tones out. And that can be done a number of ways. It can be done with color. It can be done with your... Um, highlight and shadow, it can be done with clarity. So clarity works. So clarity is, is another form of contrast, but it's localized contrast. If we went to something like punch, you know, it can, it can really, really bring it out. It's, what it's doing is just increasing the contrast differently to what it would if we were doing it overall. So um, everything that we're photographing is there's some beautiful detail in this file, really, really lovely. Lovely detail in this little estuary. So that is, that is quite a beautiful image. The other thing I would consider is, is cropping. I find that, that by um, design, the two by three sensor is, <clears throat> for me, it's just a little bit wide and flat. I prefer a four three crop or a square crop. Um, again, that's for no other reason than that's just what I like. But um, we can go into here and so cropping is possibly something, but if we go into that color editor, I can also select areas like this and say, I want to play around with those colors, I increase the saturation, but I also want to lighten them. So I can actually start to bring, bring areas out. So however you do it, just need to work out, Michael, however you work on this, um, you know, you'll have your own workflow, but that's what I'd be looking at doing is really trying to get some different differentiation between the different areas in the frame to really, really bring out the texture in that file. Great captures, really well seen. A lot of people go up in a plane and don't, don't come back with work that's composed quite as well as that. I think uh, you're really seeing, um, seeing things beautifully and framing beautifully, Michael. Again, just try and bring out the color, you know, the red, the color is there, okay? The, the, the weather's not, you know, is a little flat, so it's not coming out. If it, if it was late afternoon sun, it would be completely different. And that's where our saturation tool can come in to play, but just, just know when to stop. You know what I mean? Know when enough is enough. A lot of people go past the point where it starts to look a little bit um, comical. I think adding saturation is fine, but just add it to the point where you think it, it, it's, it's a good uh, representation of what it was that you saw. And again, that is subjective. So any questions, Michael?
Okay. So we've got two images here in a crop. So what I'm noticing is a lot of people are, are, are really cropping their images. Um, there's not a problem with that, but my, my, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is we pay a lot of money to buy a camera that has a certain resolution so that we can really reproduce quality in prints and so forth. And then we crop it and we're throwing a lot of that resolution away. So I go back to my earlier comment about really thinking about what it is you're trying to show and trying to get it right in camera and use cropping as a last resort. Um, in this instance, I actually like, I, actually, I think I actually prefer the uncropped version to the cropped version. I think it's this, this line coming in from the edge is telling a little bit more of a story. So I would have probably left this as it is and that is the same shot, isn't it? That rock is there. Yeah, it is the same shot. Sorry, I'm just trying to marry things up. I actually, I, I really quite like this in here. So again, playing. So think, think of your raw processor just like a dark room. In a dark room, we would dodge and burn. We'd brighten shadows, we'd burn in bright areas to try and get the tones where we wanted them. That's really all we're doing on the, on the computer. So put our white points where they should be. Our whites, that's, that's lifted it. Okay. Perhaps like to lift the shadows a little bit. Just a little bit, but it's doing it to everything. So I'd probably go in just with a brush, paint it in there, and just lift the shadows in that area only. Bring it out a little bit. Um, pull the highlights on there back a little bit. Okay, just so that we're not looking at a black blob, we're actually seeing some texture. Overall, we could probably pull the highlights in a little bit. Bring some more detail in and just punch the white. So what I'm doing here, bringing the highlights in is actually bringing the texture of that sky back in. But doing that can actually make it quite muddy. So the white part of the cloud can actually start to look grey. So I use the highlight recovery to bring the, the texture and the, the detail of the clouds back. But then in order to make them not look like a, like a, a grey, I bring it back just add some white back into it. So we're just playing around with the white point of that area, but bringing everything under that white point down, toning it down a little bit. Again, I don't think it needs this, quite as much saturation as what's been put in there. This is looking to me a lot more natural. Okay, so I actually think it's holding together really, really quite well. So I would, I would possibly drag some, some sky in. Some tonally I'm talking about here. So I just darken that down a little bit. Just a little bit, throw it in. And then add a little bit of clarity overall. Bit of punch. Perhaps a smidgen of, of saturation. And I actually think what I'm looking at here is, is a scene that's rich. It's rich in tonality, it's rich in color in the sky, but it's not looking fake. It's not looking like it's something that we've, we've put, into, put some filter over in, in Snapseed or in Photoshop to try and make it look like something it isn't. Um, I just, you know, just pulling that saturation back, I think would really improve that image out of sight. So I think it looking, it's probably just, you know, I don't know what software it's done in and the increments are different. I actually think it looks much nicer there than there. Very, very common thing, people, people oversaturating. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions on that? Oh, we'll keep going. Sadly, we only have a raw file here, so we'll, we'll play with this very, very quickly. I would, in this one, I would try and bring some detail in the sky while maintaining the detail in the rocks. Now, this is probably a good example of a histogram where, where the rocks are quite dark, but it's looking a little bit wishy-washy. So what we need to do is we get our whites where they should be first and foremost, all right? I would then play with my highlight recovery, which I can do just to get some tone in the sky. Add some white to it. This could possibly be a really good black and white image. 
So something like this would, you know, may work very, very well in black and white. So, but also, so we'll, we'll, explore, we'll explore that for a moment. Now that's that's looking quite quite good as a as a square image there. Let's just make sure that horizon's straight. Okay, so with black and white, what we can do is we can play around with the colors within the image to try and bring it out. So if I turn this off, we notice there's a little bit of sort of yellowy pink in the sky there. So if I go to the yellow, slider here, I can really start to accentuate that. There's also a little bit of pinky magenta, so that's not having as much of an effect. But the sea is sort of a greeny. Green. So if we play around with our sliders, we can really start to you know, change the overall effect of that file. I'm thinking that's working quite well in black and white. What I would do is I would go back to my highlight recovery tool and add some blacks into those shadow areas. And then perhaps some vignetting. And I think that is a stunning image in black and white. So that would be my treatment if this was my file. That is, that is how I would, I would treat it. I think this would work really well as a black and white image. And you don't have to spend a lot of time. You can, you can spend as much time on it as you like. Um, I would probably go even further by doing a Luma mask. I'll do it very, very quickly because we're running out of time. Um, <coughs> and the Luma mask is just going to select the highlights. All right, so we'll go into here. So I will do a new filled mask, new fill adjustment layer, and I'll go Luma range. And I will put the display, the mask on, and I will go... So what I'm doing is I'm trying to select the whiter parts of the frame, the lighter parts. I'm moving that up. So the red, when we're looking at a mask like this, is what I'm selecting. Okay, and I'll just do that very, very. So I can now go in and play with just the highlighted areas of the frame to really add some more, some more punch to it. So I don't know how that's appearing on your screen, but, you know, and then I may go into areas and say, okay, I'd like to, to just bring a bit of detail out in here or, you know, like selective, selecting uh, certain areas selectively, which is, a, so I can just paint that in. You don't have to be, if you've got a feathered edge, you don't have to be uh, too, Let's try again. You don't have to be too fussy because the edge is blurred. You can always you can always rub it back if you need to. So I can go in there. It's looking see how it's looking wishy washy where I've brightened it. If I now go and add black to that, I can get rid of that wishy washiness. And what I've done is I've brought it out. I've brought all the detail out without it actually looking flat. So if we go in close, I can actually now see detail in that rock that we that was getting blocked up earlier on. A great image. I've, pro I've probably gone too far with that. I've lost too much in the sky, but that's that's where I'd be taking that one if that was if that was my shot. Any questions, Paul? No. Okay, Sally. Uh, I had a look at this one earlier. I love this image. My two comments would be: I don't think it needs the noise that's that's been added into it. I think we've got all this great texture in in the tiles, in the bridge, and the noise is just fighting to that. And I would question the crop. I actually, um, I actually quite like the way you framed it in camera. I don't think you need to crop it or, or you don't need to crop it anywhere near as much. So I would revisit that by going into the black and white tool in my raw processor. And as a start, getting the sky, you know, where I'd like it to be, getting the... Um, Getting the black and white, you know, where I would where I would like it to be. 
And then I should have done this first, get my white point or my exposure right before I go into the sky. So what we want to do is, is try and, I'll just reset that and I'll go back. Okay, so we want to try and darken that sky. So, okay, I suppose my point with the, with the noise is we've got all of this lovely detail in the tiles here and it's just jumping out of the screen and the noise is, is, is just fighting with it a little bit too much. So, you know, we can go in into here and choose the white areas. So we can brighten the whites, pull the highlights in, brighten the whites. But that would really be my only comment for that one, Sally, is, is just the cropping and the noise. The other thing you'll notice with the noise, it's added this sort of crunchiness in here. Um, that you should be able to get that out playing with clarity and but without all that without the crunchiness so that's bringing that dark rim like you have here but but again without the noise so i used to use silver effects a lot for my black and whites and i found that silver effects in order to get the sort of the structure and the and the clarity in the file that i wanted was always putting a lot of noise in the frame so i've I've gone back to trying to do it as best as I can in my raw converter. But uh, if you look at them, um, so here's the JPEG. I've probably brought the, the white out a little bit too much here in relation to yours. But I think the Sydney Opera House tiles, they are pristine, they are white. I'd, I'd really want them to jump out and hit me. Um, I'm really liking this little break in the, in the sails, which is why I probably wouldn't crop it. I think that's actually adding to it. It's a, it's a little mysterious, you know, what's under there, what's in there. I, I can't ever remember seeing that on the Opera House. I'm a bit intrigued what's there. So I'd, I'd consider that crop and the noise. Other than that, I, um, I think it's a great capture. Well, I think it's a great capture period. It's the treatment, really. I would, I would just tone down that noise. All right, we'll go to the last one. And that is a, okay, so so Susan, you've, looking at this, you've pretty much done exactly what I would do, in, and that is like reduce the, the top down a little bit more. I would probably crop this one a, a smidgen tighter. I'm a, um, I'm a firm believer in, you know, being very, very deliberate with our, with our cropping. So I would, take this i'm just looking at this we're just sort of clipping the top of the oh, wrong crop sorry i look like i'm fumbling because most of my tools are hidden behind a zoom panel that i can't see so i'm trying to find them without being able to see them so i apologize but i'll go to an unconstrained crop i'll just get rid of that one so I'm thinking a little bit more aggressive in the cropping. I don't think it needs the panoramic. I'd I think the hero of this shot is the bird. And I think because we don't have the whole bird in the reflection so that we've got like this mirror, uh, this distorted mirror image happening, we don't need a whole lot of it. What we have there is really grounding the bird. And I think that is probably a better way of, of presenting it. Um, could probably pull it out a little bit. The panoramic type of crop, the elongated crop, um, you know, it really needs the right shot. You know, don't be afraid to try and crop it differently. Um, and when in doubt, squares always work. Find that a square frame always works. But not in this case. So four, three, just play around with your crops. You know, really, everything else, you know what you've done to the colours good? We've got beautiful white in the in the in the plumage here in the in the feathers. Lots of detail. It's working really really quite well. This shot is really about the bird. Okay, so we don't need all of its environment, you know, showing in the frame. I think having some of it's good, but having too much is actually starting to take away. So keeping that bird in, you know, the two thirds of the frame there to give you that. Um, you know, 
thir uh, one thirds rule of the frame is working really quite well. So, you know, looking at that, that's probably all I do to it is just change the crop. You've actually really pulled a lot of detail out of that out of the bird. It's it's working quite well. Very good. That was the last one. Any questions? No questions? I've saved a lot of the questions. So I'll email those to you afterwards. Okay, no worries at all. Yeah. So in closing, what I would say, I'd just like to say the standard pretty much across the board tonight is very, very high. Um, I reiterate what I said earlier is just when you're shooting, you know, as a photographer, you get better the more you do. And, and if we just go out and point the camera and shoot, that's fun. But if you really want to improve your photography, think about, ask yourself these questions when you're pointing the camera. Am I in the best possible place? Am I using the right lens to take this shot? Would it look better if I went in closer with a wider lens, further back with the longer lens, as I said earlier? Um, would it be better if I stepped a metre to the right so that the arrangement of things within my frame is a little bit different? These are all things that we should be thinking about when we're shooting. Um, and we need to practice that so that when we get a situation, when we get something moving like that, it's almost an instant reaction. You don't even think about it anymore. You just step sideways and go bang because you've already anticipated that, <clears throat> that things will fall into place if you take a step left or right. A lot of, uh, a lot of you would have heard of the decisive moment, sort of a, a genre of photography or a style of photography, if you like, that was brought to the forefront by uh, Henry Cartier-Bresson back in the 50s. That, a lot of people think that's about freezing action. It's not. It's about looking at your composition and doing one or two things, stepping left or right so that all of the elements line up beautifully or waiting for the elements to come into the frame and pushing the button when the composition is at its best. Uh, an example of that would be, I was given a print this week by a, a Sydney-based photographer um, in Turkey and he was, he was looking down on a, a big mosaic uh, Piazza, I don't know what you call it, like a square with great big patterns in it. And there are three great groups of people walking across, but he waited till all of the people were in the middle of the same colored uh, pattern across the square. So when you look at the print, they're all exactly where you'd expect them to be. If he had have taken a minute earlier, the photo wouldn't have, a second earlier, the photo probably wouldn't have worked. If he had waited a little bit longer, longer it wouldn't have worked he waited for that right moment when all the elements were in the best possible position to photograph before he pushed the button so things like that when we're shooting will really really improve our photography at the end of the day photoshop capture one lightroom they're all tools to extract the best out of the frames that we got the real art takes place when you push the button and that's probably where we need to focus the most of our um can't think of the right word to say the most of our effort into getting the shot is at that point when we push the button because that if you've got a great image to start with you can make it outstanding using software if you have a very average image to start it it will still be an average image after you've put it through software but it will be better than what it was if that if that makes sense to you and I, I, I apply this to myself. Not every photograph I take is a, is a winning photograph. I'd say more often than not, they're not, but I'm always striving to get it right in camera. So if you start thinking like that when you're out shooting, your photography will improve and you'll have to do less and less in front of the computer. All right, that's, uh, that's it for me. If there's no uh, pressing questions. Okay. Thank you, Ian, for your great insights. And thank you to everyone. Stop sharing. <laughs> it's very, very difficult on the fly to look at so many images and, and, and offer real sound advice. They're just little snippets and little tips that we do on the fly. If I had, you know, you really need time to absorb uh, an image, look at the image and, and take it in. So 
you know, what I've said to you may not be 100% right in, in a lot of cases, but if it's causing you to think about what you're doing, then, you know, then it's been, um, then it's been worthwhile. So thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for everyone who, who joined us as well. Um, so this session was also recorded and will be available tomorrow. I will be sending out an email with all the details where you can rewatch the session again. But um, if you YouTube BenQ Australia, the video should be up probably by midday. Um, and if, if your questions were not answered, I already noted down the questions and your names as well. So I'll follow through with Ian and get some answers on those. Also, if you feel free to contact us through our live chat agent on bnq.com.au or email us directly at bqamarcom at bnq.com. We'll also endeavor to provide a response to you as early as possible. We also have our specialized resellers who would be able to answer any of your technical questions that you may have as well. Also, don't forget to fill out the quick survey with also a special offer for you guys. Thank you for your time and see you again next month. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Ian. See you later. See you later. Bye-bye.